Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Each week, we stop everything we're doing in the service, stop all of our own agendas, and together as a church, we fix our collective gaze of our minds and hearts on Jesus. We follow Jesus' instruction to remember him by taking a piece of bread, a symbol of Jesus' body, and a cup of juice, a symbol of his blood, and we eat and drink it in remembrance of him. Today we're going to be using Jesus' words in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35, to guide us in our remembrance. If you don't have a Bible, we have one for you. Can you raise your hand if you don't have a Bible, and we'll give you one? And if you don't own a Bible, please keep this as our gift to you. So in Matthew 18, verse 21, in response to Jesus' teaching about the church's role in restoring a sinning brother, Peter is concerned with how many times it's appropriate to forgive one who sins against him. Just how patient, how forgiving should we be with one another? When someone sins against us, how much forgiveness is appropriate and when is enough enough? There certainly has to be a balance between grace and justice when people sin against us, right? Our hearts can be tempted to ask the same question as Peter, to think similar thoughts, and we need to hear Jesus' answer. So read, let's read together Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, How often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. So let's just stop at this point. It would be helpful at this point in Jesus' story to consider the plight of this slave who is just mentioned. The master wants to settle accounts, and the time has come for the slave to pay what he owes or else face the consequences. This slave, it is said, owes 10,000 talents. So how much money is this exactly? If a a slave owed a few days' wages, perhaps even a month or a year's wage, he might have a hope at paying it off or finding some family or friends to pay his bill. A talent, though, a talent is the amount of money that a man like this one might earn after 20 years of daily labor. It would take this man 5,000 lifetimes or more to pay this off an obvious, impossible task. One helpful commentator talking about the amount of the debt said 10,000 talents, 60 million denarii, or some 300 tons of silver is a sum far outside any individual's grasp. 10,000 is the largest numeral for which a Greek term exists, and the talent is the largest known amount of money. And so when the two are combined, the effect is like our zillions. What God has forgiven his people is beyond calculation. You might be tempted to stop listening at this point and just say that the premise of this story is ridiculous. It could be How could it be possible to rack up such a humongous debt? But then you need to pause and realize that this story is actually about you, and it's about me. And 10,000 talents actually underrepresents, underestimates the debt that we owe. And could never, even in 5,000 lifetimes or 5,000 zillion lifetimes, hope to pay back. In fact, every day that we live on our own 
doesn't go towards paying this debt off. It only goes towards accumulating more. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 speaks of a certificate of debt with legal demands that stand against us. And that debt is made up of our transgressions against a perfectly holy God, all-knowing, who sees everything, judges perfectly, and to whom this debt is actually owed. And one day, very soon, each one of us feel this. Don't just let this be a theological truth or think I'm talking about someone else or humanity in general. Each one of us personally, specifically, will stand before this king, this judge, and it will be time to settle accounts. Do you think that you can save up enough good works to pay off your sin? This is what every religion except biblical Christianity tries to accomplish. All of humanity in some way or another pretends that this debt isn't there or minimizes it or hopes that by doing enough good things, the weight of the bad things might just be offset. Like your child hoping to help pay down your home mortgage with a few pennies, only far more futile. We do not have the currency that's needed to pay off our debt. And the rightful judgment that we have earned is right, and it's eternal judgment in hell. This is your real, actual plight. It's far worse, far more hopeless than the one that the slave in this story found himself in. And let's continue. Start again in verse 24. When the king had begun to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I'll repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him that debt. Imagine the joy of this man upon receiving the good news that his master had compassion on him, forgiving him the debt or the joy that he should have had. This should change everything. The master didn't just say, okay, I'll give you more time. He offered to wipe the man's slate clean. This was completely unmerited grace. There was nothing this slave could boast of from that day forward except his master's generosity and grace. A day should not have gone by in this slave's life when he did not marvel in his king's generosity and live in the perspective and joy that it afforded. Christian, Paul writes of the day that our master did the same for us, but actually on an unimaginably larger scale and at an infinitely higher cost to himself. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. Don't worry about turning there. Just listen in awe and worship as I read. And you, who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Listen here. Having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us with all of its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. God didn't merely write off the debt pretending it didn't exist. His holy justice would not allow that. Rather, he paid every cent of it with his son's own blood. As Jesus hung on the cross, 
our debts, our sins were placed on him. He paid what we never could in 5,000 lifetimes or 5,000 zillion lifetimes as he, the perfect, sinless God-man, the second person of the Trinity, bore all of God's righteous wrath for all the sins of those who would believe in him. Every moment of every day of our life must be lived remembering, glorying in, responding appropriately to God's incredible mercy and grace towards us. And now the answer to Peter's initial question is obvious. How many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Jesus responded with this parable to help us understand the relative weight of our offenses against each other compared to the weight of our offense against God. And if God has forgiven you such an infinite debt, it should be inconceivable that we would not be quick to forgive each other our much smaller, finite offenses. So remembering the cross, the debt we owed, and God's lavish love and mercy should protect us against an unforgiving or loving, unloving attitude towards each other. But verse 28, that slave went out and found his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience on me, I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he owed. So his fellow slaves saw what had happened, and they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved to anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. This time of communion should guard us against acting like that wicked slave. If this slave had generously extended mercy to his fellow slave for the small hundred denarii, hundred days wages, could he have been said to have earned his master's gift of 10,000 talents of generosity? No. But in light of the incalculable forgiveness that he had just received, it would have been totally appropriate to have responded with patience and mercy. Instead, he acted incomprehensibly inconsistent with the mercy his master was willing to show him. And Christian, at this time of communion, Practice doing what you should do in every moment of your life as you remember God's incalculable mercy towards you. It would be appropriate if you consider if there's any part of your life where you're not living appropriately, not living consistently in response to that mercy. The perspective and joy that we obtain in the shadow of the cross is priceless. Is there any offense that you feel is too great against you to forgive? Something that you're holding on to, demanding that somebody pay what they owe you. Are you patient, loving, quick to forgive when you're sinned against? Remember the cross. Don't just go through the motions this morning. Remember the cross. Remember Jesus and the magnitude of his grace. And when you remember that, we shouldn't help but be able to be merciful towards one another. Communion's a time designed to remember Jesus, his body broken and blood poured out, the payment for the record of debt that stood against us now being nailed to the cross. Remember Jesus rightly and take the bread and juice and forgive your brother from your heart. And it's important to recognize, it's important to recognize that not all who have a debt against God will have that debt wiped clean.
listen carefully here. It's only those who turn to him in faith, pleading for mercy, who receive it. You cannot earn God's favor, and you cannot pay your debt. But he offers to pay it for you if you would only believe. And belief has to be more than a mental assent, as this parable and the rest of Scripture shows. You must first recognize that you've sinned against God, that you actually have an incalculable debt. You must despair of paying that debt on your own and plead with God for mercy, a mercy that only comes through the sinless death of Jesus on behalf of sinners. And God will forgive you, changing your heart so that you can live your life by faith. Now, among other miraculous heart changes, being able to actually forgive your brother from the heart. So if you're not a Christian, if you haven't fallen down before the master yet and pleaded with him to forgive your debt, don't wait. Fall down now and ask for mercy. Plead for mercy while there's time. But if you won't, if you haven't yet, please just let the bread and juice pass when it comes. Please don't leave here without talking to me. Somebody else about this mercy. Even better, just cry out now. Become his child. Take the bread and juice in remembrance with us. For all who have received the master's incredible, incalculable mercy, remember the great love which, through which it was purchased. Jesus' death as you take the bread and juice. Men, please serve us. And then eat the bread and juice on your own as your heart's prepared. And then we'll pray together in a few minutes.